Hello and welcome to Evoke Ag, where we connect the global agri-food tech community. I'm Ariana Sapel, a Senior Advisor at Austrade and the Ag Tech Lead. Today we are discussing AgriWeb's journey into the UK with Chairman and Co-Founder Justin Webb and Tess Thomas, Director of Investment for Australia and New Zealand at the UK Department for International Trade. Welcome to you both. Justin, do you want to give us a, a, a quick overview of how you came to be founding AgriWeb? <laughs> Well, how I came to be is probably a longer introduction, <laughs> but um, thank you so much for, for having me here, Ayana. And the background of, of, of my story really was, um, I come from five generations of livestock farming here in Australia, um, but I grew up overseas, um, mostly in the UK, um, but studied um, <clears throat> applied mathematics uh, at, at Harvard and Oxford um, and uh, created four different companies in uh, financial management and governance. Um, so when I went back to, uh, to home, to a farm, um, I was amazed to find that um, our decisions on farm were really based on anecdote and circumstance rather than data and projected forward decision making. Uh, that really you know, culminated in the foundation of AgriWeb and, and, and where I am today. Tess. Can you, uh, you know, give us a bit of a flavour of uh, what it's like to be the, the Director of Trade and Investment here in Sydney? Sure. So I manage a team of about seven people across Australia and New Zealand, all investment specialists helping founders like Justin expand to the UK. So we have an amazing job because we get to meet some really fascinating people doing really impressive things like what Justin's doing with AgriWeb. So a day in the life is always varied. We work across all sectors, not just agri-tech. So we really are generalists and we introduce people like Justin to sector specialists in the UK, of which there are five in, in the agri-sector right now. Justin, um, can you talk us through the AgriWeb journey so far, including how you came to be in the UK? I mean, obviously you have a, a great presence there now, but how did that come to be? Sure, well, um, <clears throat> I was chatting with Tess and, and looking at some of the background and, um, uh, you know, it's almost an embarrassingly long time for a startup now. Um, we founded the business in, in 2014 and um, uh, together with my co-founder, uh, an, an American chap, Kevin Baum, and another guy uh, from South Australia, John Farger, we really set about digitizing the world of livestock agriculture, um, you know, converting, fundamentally converting what a farmer carries in their, their, their notebook in their top pocket. Um, into actionable insights, into capturing the information that's happening on farm, and then pulling together all of the different inputs, both on human recording, but also on other IoT inputs to, to increase productivity uh, and sustainably um, increase the ability for the world to produce more protein. So that sounds like a great goal, but what does that actually mean? Um, well, it's, it's meant a long journey, uh, of now more than um, 55 people um, with staff on, uh, f in five different countries. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, we now have over 11 million uh, head or uh, livestock on the platform. Um, and uh, we're covering, that sort of equates to roughly 15% of all the livestock in Australia um, with literally thousands of customers in uh, Australia United States, South Africa, Brazil, New Zealand, and the UK. Um, to directly answer the UK question, uh, we entered the UK in 2018 um, through a combination of both investment from uh, a, a large and established UK investor, as well as an acquisition that we made um, into the market. Uh, it's been you know, quite a, an arduous but a very exciting journey um, to go through all of the, you know, the, the tricks and trials of, of being a startup. I'm pretty sure we've made all of the mistakes we were told not to and <laughs> then some. Um, but I think that uh, fundamentally we've, we've maintained quite true to our values, uh, which is actually adding value to a farmer. Uh, uh, we, we believe that we live for the farmer. So if everything we do can culminate in adding value to farmers standing in their fields, standing in their sheds, then we think we're doing a good thing. In addition to that, we really hope that the sustainable production not only enables uh, output to feed you know, the, the 10 billion people by 2050, but it also enables uh, us to target things like uh, carbon emissions, um, you know, livestock globally um, is, is probably not in vogue um, for its carbon footprint. Um, but 
the extraordinary opportunity is unlike almost any other industry that talks about reducing its carbon footprint, we could actually be carbon negative by uh, regeneration of pastures, by carbon sequestration into these pastures. Grazing of animals is one of the only industries now in the world that can be carbon negative. And the only way we achieve something like that is by digitizing the on-farm uh, record keeping and actioning protocols that, that do achieve some of these uh, some of these positive results. Sustainable protein is is you know something we've we've talked a few times about before. Um, you know, are there are there policies or are there other things you know, encouraging greater adoption for that in in the UK market? Well, sure. I think um, you know there's there's two sides to how we uh, as as a global community are approaching our food and um, and therefore leveraging technology. You know, I've uh, I've touched on that there is the natural increase in population globally. So you know, 10 billion people by 2050. And in addition to that, there is a tailwind of an increasing demand in higher order protein, which is driven by the increasing middle class wealth in China, Indonesia, uh, as well as a propensity to eat more protein, even in developed nations. Uh, and so how can we sustainably produce that? Because it is quite demanding on resources to do that. Um, and you're seeing uh, a, 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 you know, emergence of, of market um, imperfect solutions like uh, alternative proteins that play a fantastic role alongside the traditional production of protein, um, but they, at least at the moment and, uh, and forward projection, don't necessarily sit as an entire replacement. They're not commercially viable to replace that. Um, and equally, tastes haven't changed, which leads me into the next point, which is to that concurrent element of demand, we've also got a requirement for uh, an understanding of where my food came from. Right, what is the provenance of what I ate? What was its carbon footprint? What was the animal husbandry and the impact um, to where it came from? And, and people aren't accepting to just be blind to that anymore. They we're willing to pay more to understand more and be, be more, more confident about um, the methodologies and the, and the traceability. And I think you're seeing a lot of realization of that through the supply chain. You know, McDonald's uh, looking at, at guaranteeing the sustainable sourcing of, of some of its beef. Um, uh, the, the Impossible Burger emerging at, um, at Burger King, and that's at the mass market. And, and of course, that just um, you know, emerges much more strongly as you move up to the, to the higher orders. So I think pulling all that together, it, there's this huge demand and need but yet the supply side hasn't changed. Right? We haven't created more land, and we certainly haven't changed the genetics of, of uh, the, the base production. So this is a technology, uh, sorry, this is a problem that technology is box-seated to fix, because this is what technology does best. It, it takes limited resources and increases productivity to have a sustainable output from that. Um, and you know, to, to case that in the United Kingdom, uh, the UK's population, um, well, less than 60% of what the UK consumes is produced by British farmers. And there are about 200,000 farmers in the UK, uh, which equates to quite small individual production. And as a result, uh, less than 50% of those UK farms are actually profitable. They've been um, heavily subsidized by the common agricultural policy. And as macroeconomic and geopolitical forces start to change those subsidies, ultimately there needs to be an increase in productivity somewhere. And the real positive story of this is not farmers are going to go out of business. It's the, cheaper, the adoption of cheap and accessible and incredibly powerful technologies mean that we can start to not only feed that population that demands it, but do so from the existing infrastructure that it is at. Coming back to how you know how you have, have been able to sort of scout that opportunity, I guess, and, and figure out where in the UK you've you might locate, or in and you know therefore also you know how you might scout other markets as well. How did you go about that? How did you um, figure out where the the best places uh, you know to access labour or the best um, you know sites or you know where where there were producers who might be you know, hungry for for those solutions. 
This is where I can very easily turn to Tess and say, <laughs> uh, you know, it's all due to her um, and due to the, you know, UKTI um, uh, or UKIT. Was UKTI? UKTI no, and now DIT. Um, <laughs> And you know, way back in 2016, um, uh, we were um, I mean, really barely, barely beyond a concept, and as I say, deep in all of those mistakes. And um, I reached out to uh, uh, to the group and, and and essentially said I was coming to the UK for a family trip, um, but went to London and attended an event, and I was just blown away by this this gathering of support around the concept. Uh, you know, it was in less than ten days. I found myself swept into a full, um, a full, fully orchestrated, um, you know, journey around uh, the best of agriculture. And and really, I'm, I'm being light about this, but it was amazing the meetings I was able to have. The 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 decision makers, the power brokers in the UK uh, industrial, you know, agricultural industrial area. Where I was all of a sudden sitting, you know, across this, across the, the the table from a, a kingmaker um, in in our industry, and and that was just transformative because I thought, wow, if we can, you know, on one trip start to open these doors through, you know, what was what was on offer, um, clearly there's an opportunity to to make an impact here in the in that market. Yeah, no, I think certainly for, for companies coming into Australia as well as companies coming to the UK and into other markets, those, you know, supported site visits and, and introductions and referrals, just so powerful, you know, help you get, you know, so much further than you might otherwise if you're going to try and <laughs> do it, do it, um, you know, with, with the, the yellow pages and, and whatever else. Well, I we've tried that too and it hasn't worked very well, <laughs> so, yeah. Tess, is, is, that, is that the same experience of all the other companies that you work with? Yeah, look, it's really bespoke for every company that we do work with. I mean, they can be coming to us at any stage of their journey. I think we were quite fortunate with Justin that um, he came to us quite early in the piece. And it really is a textbook case study because Justin came to us and he was planning on going to the UK. And we always encourage companies that you have to plan a trip and we're here to support you. So we work with our local enterprise partners. So with Justin, we work with a local enterprise of the Southwest region. We put together this fantastic long week program and we also worked with the agritech specialist Clive at the time, who actually is employed by the DIT government, but also stays in con connected into industry as well. So they have their contacts and networks ongoing, which is really, really valuable to people like Justin. So it's really about doing that market research, understanding where you need to go in the market, understanding the competitive landscape and the regulatory environment. So we help them map out that journey and also just really be thinking about immigration requirements, um, setting up your business registration. How does that look? Is it a subsidiary? Is it going to be a global HQ? Do you want to export from there? So there's a lot of things to think about and plan well in advance before you, before you set up a presence. So, um, and it's also free, free and confidential to any business looking to do it. So, so why not? <laughs> so, so I guess my, my next question is for you know for you know other companies who are out there who are thinking about you know maybe going to the UK. When should people reach out? Um, I would say when you're first looking at getting that first customer in the UK, you should contact us, and and we are in every state across Australia and in New Zealand. So as I said, completely free information that you have access to, and we have the specialists in the UK that we can connect you with that work across the two time zones. So. When you're first looking at mapping out that UK customer, get in touch with us and we're here to support. So we work with some companies, say 12, 18 months in advance before they're ready to go over because we need to make sure that you're doing it at the right time. Very, very good uh, <laughs> tip there. Um, in terms of, you know, how the UK features in your business now, you know, what, what sort of role does, does the UK play and your, your operations there? <coughs> well, I mean, uh, you know, from... Tessa's comments about when to when to look at um, other markets and and when to reach out, you know the answer is yesterday. Um, you can't. You almost the one mistake you won't make is is gathering information about potential areas too early, and you won't gather too much information. And you know two sides to that um, is engaging with with DIT and engaging with Austrade, um, both of whom you know, have a, just an extraordinary wealth of information to be able to, to build your, you know, your war chest of understanding. Um, and, and the more that you can really investigate the market, 
and then start to segment the market and then really start to be precise about what you're launching because these are very big uh, and complex economies that you're going into and it doesn't matter whether it's ag tech or fintech or um, any area of expansion to best understand it, you really need to start to delineate what is going to be your target customer and are, are, is the pain point or are the pain points that you are looking to solve and your value proposition, are they, are they equally matched by a customer base that exists over there? And then you start to open the wonderful Pandora's box of localization and, and price sensitivity and all those good things. So um, once you sort of can get through all of that and leverage the information, and it really isn't uh, a one-stop shop with, um, you know, with DIT or, or with Austrade, it's a journey. And, and AgriWeb has found that uh, again and again. Um, being able to develop, evolve as our, our complexity, as our integration with these markets start to evolve, you move from, okay, what's going on in this, in this continent or in this country to um, can you give me some more precise ideas about this locality and then can we start talking about hiring people, visas, grants, bank um, localization, <laughs> bank accounts in the UK, that's a fun one. Um, and, and, and then you start, you know, then it's, then it's hiring people and recruitment. And, and then you start getting into, you know, initiatives that are backed by the, by the local government. I mean, the, the Innovate UK is a fantastic program to, um, to really understand, get involved with and see if it aligns with your business goals. Because it's not just about grant money, it's also about developing a, a platform where you collaborate with established either academic or corporate entities to bring something to market. Yeah. And that's pretty extraordinary uh, because having opened other countries, it, it's just not the same um, in, in terms of doing that. So. Coming to, you know, hopefully coming round back to answer your original question, I mean, the establishment of the footprint in the UK and its role that it now plays, I mean, it is, uh, well, the main hub of Agrib still remains in, in Sydney. Um, it's unquestionable that, you know, our second, our second hub and the launch pad for all of Europe and now into the United States has been from, uh, from London and Belfast, where we've established two offices over there. The, the, the talent, the understanding, the ability to market test, and frankly, the proximity of time zone has been uh, a fantastic sort of launch and spring springboard into these other markets. I, I will also just ask you both about capital and access to capital, because it's a perennial question and a perennial challenge for, for uh, startups and scale-ups. I mean, you know, what sort of support mechanisms are there in the UK to help people find and connect with potential capital partners? And then Justin, how would you describe um, you know, the, the type of capital that you find in the, US, in, in the UK? But Tess? Yeah, sure. So everyone wants to know about accessing capital. It's probably the biggest question we get asked from a lot of our founders. Um, so it, w it would have to be, I mean, first and foremost, it's understanding the VC market, the breadth and depth of the venture capital market. So you have specialist investors in specialist sectors. So there is a whole world of agri-tech VC investors who are dedicated to that sector. Um, there is a meetup every night and you will go out there and you will go to a meetup just dedicated to ag tech in London in the Silicon Roundabout, which is basically the UK's tech centre, epicentre. Um, so it's, that's why we always say you need to get there, you need to go over there because you can go to these meetups and you can meet such interesting and fascinating people and you get access to that kind of capital. Um, another source of capital is Innovate UK, who Justin mentioned. So these are, this is the government's innovation agency. Um, the real mission for this innovation agency is to commercialise R&D. So it's giving you access to experts, academia and um, infrastructure to help you commercialise your product or service. And this grant funding mechanism they have is, is a really good way to access capital in the UK. Justin, how would you suggest people approach capital in the UK? How, how should they approach? How Respectfully. Should, how, how should they approach conversations? Like, how does it differ from, say, approaching a VC in the US or approaching someone in Australia, say? Sure. Um, I, I, I think that there's, there's a couple of different dynamics, and, and you've phrased the question very well, um, which is there's this there's a general global attitude, and I'll speak in broad strokes and generalizations, so forgive me, because each one is particular to the, um, the, the interaction that you're going to have. However, 
in the United States, you tend to need to be a sledgehammer. You have to come and make a really loud and big impact because it's, it's you know, a plethora of ideas. You're one of, of 20 meetings that day and 1,000 meetings that month. And how are you going to stand out from the crowd? Um, and so, and, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a genetic trait in, in the United States that they have an incredible ability to sell and, and sell themselves. Um, whereas, you know, perhaps the Anglo-Saxon, um, Aussie, uh, Aussie and, and, and British mentality is maybe a bit more self-effacing, um, aside from around the ashes. But, um, you know, when you do get over there, it, it's, it, it don't take the, the concept of the fact that you can't put yourself forward and, and the, it would be a terrible mistake to think, to go in unprepared. Um, you know, the Aussie approach can be a bit more jovial, a bit more, we're, we're mates getting on. You arrive in London and the, the difference maybe from Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley uh, to whether it's Silicon, Silicon Roundabout <laughs> or, um, or you know, uh, Mayfair um, is they are very precise. They tend to be um, focusing in tighter verticals. Um, they tend to have a much tighter mandate of what they're looking at. If they are ag tech, they are ag tech. If they are fintech, they really understand it. And, and um, also, it would be a, a gross mistake to, to say, well, because it's a smaller market, the, the understanding is not as deep. Um, I found myself woefully um, wrong-footed when, when going in and kind of being a bit jovial and, and the meeting was over very quickly, I think, because it, the reality is you know, um, that they have a very deep understanding. They have very clear execution goals and, and they understand it from a global perspective. One of the elements about going to the United States is it tends to be come to the United States because it's such a big market and we can build your business. Um, in Australia, we feel that a lot because we need to go to external markets. Israel is famous for you know, global first um, because they don't have a big domestic market. In London and in Europe generally, there tends to be a recognition of you can make a very big business in Europe, but also we can invest into businesses that can go global and don't even have to have a European footprint. Which is, which is a contrast. It's very tricky to find that in the United States. So advice on going there is to really do your homework. Really understand who you are. It's not just the brand that you're talking to, the partner that you're going to meet with. The, you know, understand her background, her interests, as much as you can find out about um, that connection. And then really know your stuff and have a very tight and clear presentation, which is you know, fairly ubiquitous advice for anywhere, but I think very precise. On top of that, I think that there are other areas to access capital, as mentioned, whether it's government, grant, etc. There's also different delineation between pools of capital. Mm -hmm. um, in London, there tends to be a much more, or London and Europe generally, there tends to be a much more evolved family office. Um, you know, it's multi-generational, it's, it's fully staffed. They have specific people that are employed to understand, evaluate and invest in venture. And that really, it, you know, you can leverage that opportunity to bring your idea to a decision maker straight off the bat. You are less likely to find that in Australia or in the United States. So I think, you know, in, summing, in summation of all of that, you know, there is a, a fantastic opportunity for capital in the UK and in Europe broadly, and a fantastic opportunity to take the Australian brand to the UK but make sure you do your homework and you're really well prepared when you go. Thinking about the Australian brand for agritech in the UK, how is that, re how is that received? How is Australian agritech and food tech, you know, what's, what's the reputation? Fantastic question. Um, look, I think um, Australia stands in ag tech as a, quite a unique position. Um, with 25 million people, it's tough to go with a consumer technology, a consumer app, and say that we've really market tested. Because again, you, you arrive in Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley, and, and they say, well, that's great, but that's less than the greater Los Angeles er, you know, area <laughs> of population. Um, uh, and similarly, you do a FinTech here, where we have a very large superannuation um, pot of capital, but the financial industry perhaps isn't as, de it certainly isn't as developed as London or New York. No one wakes up in Wall Street and says, I wonder what happened in Sydney last night. So the idea is if you can, um, you know, sorry, conversely, 
in ag tech, we're the largest exporter um, of sheep meat. We're the second largest exporter of beef. This is globally. We're the fourth largest exporter of grain. We have one of the most advanced traceability platforms for all of our livestock in the world. You know, you really are testing yourself up against the best. That the size and scale of our corporate farms blows away almost anywhere else in the world, yet the sophistication of our smallest operators is right up there. And so if you can produce an ag tech product that is successful in Australia, that it almost validates you when you arrive in, you know, in London or in Silicon Valley or in Denver, Colorado or wherever else you're trying to go with the product. And I think that brand is very exportable and should be leveraged by hopefully some of the ag tech entrepreneurs that are listening to this, in which case I can't wait to, I can't wait to partner <laughs> with you guys. Absolutely. Well, look, thank you both very much for, for joining me today. It's been a really great conversation. And thank you so much for listening and joining us as well. To hear more great conversations, go to evokeag.com or follow us on your preferred social media channel. <laughs>